Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation at all ages and at all stages of life in living out our mission of growing in mind, body, and spirit, of embracing freedom, of loving and welcoming all, and of doing our part to help heal the world. For our uh, first Sunday this month, we are beginning the theme of opening to joy. But I recognize that there is partially a path to getting that opening place. So some of the service today may help us be more open when we talk about joy next Sunday. I want to honor those who have come before us, those who are here before we have gathered. And in that, I include the name of the Peoria people. This is their ancestral home. They greeted the first European settlers and aided them. And we offer our humble respect for their history and for their ongoing life. We also practice being good stewards of the congregation. This beloved community is sustained by the time and the skill and talents and financial support of members and friends. And the offering plates are by the door as you enter and leave the sanctuary. Please leave a financial gift as you go out and donations are accepted online as well and through mail. All the ways, all the ways that we can receive of your generosity because everything we do, everything we offer, makes a difference in how we are able to live into our ministries, how we are able to live into the mission of this congregation. Thank you for being so generous. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you. And I have an additional note uh, for today. We are, it looks like we have two holiday, um, holiday collections. One you were, might have been seeing on the slides. We're receiving donations for Sharon Willows um, to help some of the residents there with a little bit of something for the holidays. But I believe we'll also be hearing uh, from Social Impact about gifts for a number of families um, to be supporting this holiday season too. So stay tuned, stay tuned, and your shopping is not done yet. I just want you to know. Some of you might dread that. Some of us are going to enjoy that. We respect all perspectives on the shopping. <laughs> and now I would like you to rise in body or spirit and join me in our first hymn, Now Let Us Sing. This is one of those that is good for the movement and good for the spirit in all the ways that we gather. And there's also a clap. You can clap along at any time, but there's also a clap at the end. Watch me for the clap. And now, now let us sing. Please rise and body your spirit. opening words today are entitled, Here We Are So Gathered, by Lisa Doge. Here is where we gather in the presence of the sacred. Here is where we gather to experience the holy. 
Here is where, together, we face the unanswerable questions and acknowledge that not knowing is as sublime as it is frustrating. Here is where we unite in the midst of life and all the glories and suffering it can hold, knowing both are ever present. Here is where we ask, think, risk, discuss, ponder, and offer what might not be welcomed or even acceptable somewhere else. Here is where, if we allow it, we are deeply moved. Here is where we encounter each other in deep and powerful ways that surprise us, yet without which we would not survive. Here we gather to worship, to experience something happen, perhaps something different for each of us according to our beliefs, something unnamed, uncategorized, and unusual, yet absolutely necessary. Here we are so gathered, our minds, our hearts, and our souls. And so our worship begins. Our chalice lighters this morning are the Kadanaway family. Welcome. Cherishing Our Differences by Cindy Feskin. We are all capable in different ways with various strengths and talents. We are all holy, part of the universe and the inter interdependent web. We light this chalice, cherishing our differences and holding each other in sacredness. We have a special uh, message for Hanukkah from my Universalist and Jewish colleague, Reverend Joanna Lubkin. Let us hear from her. Good morning, my name is Reverend Joanna Lubkin, coming to you from Boston with some Hanukkah greetings for the seventh day of the holiday. This year, Hanukkah starts a little early on the secular calendar, falling before the winter solstice, when the nights are still getting longer. This feeling of the days getting shorter and shorter calls to my mind this teaching, this legend from the Talmud. The rabbis imagined Adam, the first person in the Garden of Eden. And Adam notices that the days are getting shorter and darker and it's the very first winter solstice. And Adam is absolutely terrified and he is convinced that the world is ending and his death is imminent. So Adam fasts and he prays for eight days. After the solstice passes, the days gradually start getting longer and bit by bit, the light came back. Adam was so relieved as he realized that the coming and going of the darkness was simply part of how the world worked, that the following year he celebrated and feasted for eight days, the celebration of Hanukkah. This story speaks to our shared human need for light, for feasting, and for celebrations at this time of year. In all of the ways that we celebrate over these next few weeks, whether it's a celebration that you grew up with, sharing in a loved one's rituals, or creating a brand new tradition, may it bring more light and warmth into this world. So while traditionally Jewish families like my own wouldn't light our Hanukkah menorahs until after nightfall, I want to share the ritual with you. So we're going to light the candles for the seventh day and I'll sing the blessings in Hebrew, altering the name for God a little bit to save the blessings for after sundown. You're invited to sing along in Hebrew, and then to say the words together with me in English. Baruch Adoshem, 
Elokeinu melech ha'olam Asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotah V'tzivanu lehaviknev Shel Chanukah Baruch Ata Adoshem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Sheasa Nisim Avoteinu Bayamim Ha'ahem Ba'asman Ha'zeh And we say it together in English. Blessed are you, source of all, who brings moments of holiness to our lives through the ritual of lighting the Hanukkah lights. Blessed are you, source of all, who brings our attention to miracles from ages past to this very moment. And let us say, Amen. Happy Hanukkah, happy holiday season to you all in all of the ways that you celebrate. Good morning again. Today we're exploring religious questions and the reality that we all see these questions through our own unique lenses. My story today shares how this might look. It's called Different Points of View. Once upon a time, some children were playing on a beach in the sand. They were digging and padding and talking and making special creations. They talked about all kinds of things, what their special creations looked like, what they might have for lunch, and about where the sand came from. One child thought the sand came from bigger rocks. The waves kept bumping into rocks, and the rocks got smaller, and pretty soon they were sand. Another child thought that God put all those rocks there in the first place, that God made the sand. Another child didn't think it was God. He thought a long, long time ago there was a great big explosion in space and everything blew out of it. The children went on and on, telling each other what their different points of view were, until one child said, I don't know what to think. I wonder who's right. And the other children agreed. They all wondered who was right. Just then they looked up and they saw someone walking towards them on the beach. The person sort of looked like a magician, and she was carrying bags with mysterious objects poking out of them. The children jumped up from the sand and ran to see this strange person. The woman set down her bags, and then she took objects out of the bags and set them in the sand. They looked sort of like telescopes, but instead of pointing up at the sky, they were pointed down at the sand. The children were all excited. And she said, these are my pointing viewers. Would you like to look through them? And they said, of course. The magician said, now, notice that all of these pointed viewers are pointing at the same place in the sand, but you must look through each one of them and remember what you see. They all started looking. Each child looked through each viewer. Well, what did you see? The magician asked them. The children shared that in one they saw themselves making special creations in the sand, in another they saw the rocks and waves bumping into each other and tiny pieces of sand breaking off, in yet another they saw God making the sand, and in the last one they saw a big explosion shooting out the earth and rocks and sand. You see something different from each of the viewers, puzzled one of the children. But how could we? We were looking at the same thing. Ah, that's the magic of the pointing viewers, said the magician. You were looking at the same thing, but what you really saw depended on which viewer you looked through. Your minds are a lot like pointing viewers. You can use your minds to see things like the sand in different ways. But here's the best part. It doesn't mean that one way is right and the other is wrong. Depending on which pointing viewer you use, the sand can be made by God or waves or a big explosion, and all of those views can be right. The important thing is to realize that the people we're with and talking to about our questions might be looking through a different pointing viewer and seeing things differently. And 
the true magic is that if we all share our points of view with each other clearly and kindly, then we can all come up with better answers for ourselves. Then the magician picked up her pointing viewers, put them back in her bags, and was gone. The children ran back to their sand creations and went back to digging and patting and talking and sharing their points of view with each other, learning and growing wiser together. So be it with all of us. Now is the time in our service where we have a chance to light candles together. I want to invite you, as Rosa plays the music for meditation, you're welcome. I would recommend coming forward from one side of the sanctuary and coming across. I think there's room to be behind the table if you'd like. Um, keep in mind that we are also uh, on camera as we're here, so if you'd like to, if you're willing to be on camera, that's entirely up to you. If you're not, we can light a couple of extra candles along the way as well. So I want to invite you to come forth and light candles in our shared quiet as we enjoy the music together.
As Abraham Heschel reminds us, prayer cannot bring water to parched fields, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. It is in that spirit in which we gather and offer the prayers of the people, expanding the circle of our care and concern as we share the joys and sorrows of the congregation in this time. So let me begin. We have a number of things to offer. I want to offer our congratulations to Rosa Chang and her husband, Justin Kothenbluto, Blutel, I'm sorry, who in September had a baby girl named Natalie. And Rosa and baby Natalie are joining us today. Welcome back, Rosa, for the first time into our sanctuary. Just as a side note, this morning was the first time that Rosa and I met in person since, you know, all the things, right? All the joy. We send our good wishes to Catherine Burton as she settles into her new home away from home in Mexico. Catherine's new address is in the Friday email, or you can get it from the office as well. We offer our prayers for a negative test result uh, from Mary Mahalan Kafar for her friend Lynn, who is vaccinated. We hope that Lynn has a negative test and is all in good health. We offer our support and wishes for speedy and complete recoveries to Ev Maloney and her son, Paul Maloney, who are both challenged with health issues. We also include Phillips Wood, brother of Lovina Farden. Uh, Philip is undergoing additional surgery on December 2nd. Now we turn to, uh, turn to sympathy and losses. We offer our sympathy to Sherry and Andy Scholl as they mourn the recent loss of Sherry's aunt, Donna Kerr, uh, of, who is age 88, and she was in Michigan. We also offer our sympathy to Jean Burke and Cindy Hui as they mourn the December 1st passing of Cindy's mother, um, Anne Hui of Peoria. Anne was 87. And this week, we remember and honor uh, longtime member Theo Jean Kenyon. Her memorial will be at noon at the church on December 8th this week. And people are welcome to attend on, in person or on Zoom. I look forward to seeing many of you and hearing the stories and memories of someone such as renowned and just known and appreciated as Theo. And now I want to turn to our larger world. And in this moment, really in mourning as well. We offer our sympathy and our care for those impacted by the deadly school shooting in Michigan this week. At Oxford High School in suburban Detroit, the young man, fellow student, uh, brought a gun to school and four are dead, more are injured. It seems sympathy and care is never enough, but it is what we have right now. For those who have been impacted by this loss, for those who are taking care of those who are recovering and struggling, and for the leaders, that they may have wisdom in knowing how to proceed and how to do their best to keep our children safe. We also continue to offer care and sympathy for those in Kenosha, Wisconsin, 
who were recovering from the deadly assault by the driver who drove into the Christmas parade and ended up with five dead and injuring many more. Again, these things are close to home for many of us. And even if they weren't that close, they are certainly among us in human care and compassion. There's far more in our hearts and in the world than we can possibly name in this time. But we can hold them together in our circle of care. Please join me in naming what is with you, what is on your mind, what is in your heart, naming that in silence as I light our shared candles and as we hold this quiet together. Amen. For a reading, I chose a piece from my colleague, Reverend Sarah Lindsay, that she was responding to our world and simply entitles it December 2021. And Carol will offer the reading. The season of light has begun, candles in windows, the world ablaze with twinkling lights that insist on hope and happiness, even in a time that is cold and bleak. Around us the world presses, insisting on death and hurt, disease tearing through communities, bullets tearing through the flesh of children. Judgment tearing through bodies that bring life. Hunger and lack and greed tearing the world apart. And day after day, as the night deepens, tears press through eyes that have seen too much, known too much grief and sorrow, pressed from bodies that have so little left to give beyond the tears that say more than words ever could. The heart aches, the heart breaks. Hope is hard to hold on to. Possibility seems a million miles away. Just a hint of the promise that once was. Like the light of the stars that we catch in the dark, dead already beyond knowing, joy is hard to hold on to. And yet, each night, again, we take the shamash and we light candles. Small flames, one by one, defiant, free. And each night again, we flip the switch that illuminates a pine. Hundreds of tiny lights, abundant, joyful. Each night, we bring the stars into our homes 
we make the old ancient wisdom, no matter how this time wants to make it fade. And we hold it fast, declaring with each flicker that in spite of it all, even when we can barely catch it, hope exists. Declaring with each flicker that in spite of it all, even when the tears can't stop falling, joy exists. With each of the millions of lights we kindle, determination grows, warmth grows, love is known, happiness begins to bloom. So we light them as we have before and as we will again. We never stop kindling the flame. For our next hymn, this is Meditation on Breathing by Sarah Dan Jones and offered, uh, offered as a recording. I want to invite you to rise in body or spirit. And it's a part that um, it kind of comes in three parts. I welcome you to kind of figure out what, to, what your response to whichever part you choose, and you can switch parts along the way. This is fine. But how you might respond in body, how you might breathe with the music. I want to invite you to rise in body or spirit for meditation on breathing. I love the image of the children playing on the beach as we had with the story. With those infinite grains of sand and discovering and simply being there. I think that's one of the memories I have in my experience of going to the beach is just kind of wondering and being just a little bit in awe of how how many, when people, when the beach is full of people, not on top of each other, but just full enough that there's people, right? How much we're all in there and being in that moment together, doing different things, 
but encountering and sharing that experience. The perspective of the different viewers and the respect that was modeled by uh, that kind of magician and being able to share and talk and have different opinions and keep sharing and talking and keep having different opinions and still being together, that has always been presented to me as an ideal world. Part of what we're supposed to be aiming for is, is to be able to be in life and engaged together and separately and all at once. I want more of that time on the beach. And maybe even swapping out the viewers. I like that idea of the, of the swapping out the perspectives. Here's the God view. Here's a science view. Or maybe, maybe there's a way to merge some of those viewers together and it's God and science and wow, that's a whole other thing. But gosh, I know it's not that simple. I'm going to take care of the fire in front of me first. Hold on. There's so much more to the story than playing on the sand together. because we have truly different and divergent views. Swapping out the viewers is not going to solve the problem. We have truly different questions and places that we come from, and those paths lead to their own questions and conversations and so on. This moment, this moment with its convergence of holidays and holy days in this time of year kind of further inspires and confusion confuses the question of how shall we gather? How shall we celebrate and acknowledge distinctions and differences? You know, the menorah is not the star of Bethlehem, is not the winter solstice, it's not the enlightenment of Buddha under the Bodhi tree either. And the Bodhi tree is not the Christmas tree, and so on. And yet, we can also gather here and receive a special message from my colleague for lighting the seventh candle of Hanukkah. For this moment, I want to, I'm tr trying to navigate the, the diversity and the aspirations to a more pluralistic society that we have, that we can have, in a moment when I think our divisions are so dramatically deep and unfortunately have life and death consequences as well. One of the people I look at for thinking about differences is Stephen Prothero in his book, God is Not One. So he takes uh, eight major religions in the world, the ones that seem to have the most impact overall, and kind of pulls them apart and says, you know, here's the essential problem in each religion, here's the question, here's some of the ways in which each of these, uh, each of these problems is addressed in a particular religion. So in Christianity, the problem is um, good and evil, and the solution is love and following Jesus and the way, and our salvation is continuing to follow, and you can have a mix of practice as well as belief in doing so. But what we also, so we're talking about the, so part of what I appreciate about Stephen Prothero is that he's kind of naming the differences. 
that there are, in fact, distinctions and differences between different religious traditions. On the other side, I look at someone such as Karen Armstrong, who is a former Catholic nun who at one point left religion and belief entirely, and now is a scholar and an advocate for religious pluralism and an advocate for the practice of compassion. And she does that by looking deeply into different religious traditions to say, how does compassion manifest here? How does it manifest here? And what's the relationship between the two? How sh should these be in conversation with each other? Now, one of the problems, one of the risks with someone such as Prothero is to be, um, if you're taking an enor an a multi-thousand year tradition such as Christianity or Islam or so on, and saying it's answering one question, that that can be reduced to a religious essentialism, kind of reduced and reduced and reduced to saying this is all that it's about. And, and not recognize or understand the nuance of the pluralism within a particular tradition, that these have been developing over time and over multiple cultures. With someone such as Karen Armstrong, you can have the other side of kind of essentialism of saying that there's common beliefs you know, kind of reducing the common beliefs across multiple cultures on the other end as well. But what I appreciate about Prothero is to simply naming that there are in fact differences, because I think we can aspire to the, the God is one, or you know, that metaphor that, uh, of religious search that you know, it's one mountain that people are trying to climb and we just take different tracks up the same mountain. Well, that can be useful, and I've enjoyed that metaphor myself. But what I think a little further pulling apart is saying, you know what, we got a lot of different mountains, and that's also just the fact. We got a heck of a, we got a mountain range. In fact, maybe each one of us has our own little foothill, amen, right? Because what I, I think that, you know, the, the messages that can just be a little simple of they were all on the same beach, they were all on the same mountain. I want to aspire to that, and that's the ultimate truth. But in our immediate lived lives, we each got a little mountain of our own. And each faith has multiple mountains within a particular tradition, if you will. So I'm wondering, and I want to acknowledge that each of us is going to bring our own question, even within Unitarian Universalism. I mean, this is not a surprise within Unitarian Universalism that each of us would bring our own question, right? But I was loving uh, my colleagues as they're kind of playing with, well, what would be Unitarian Universalist kind of essential question? Because it's not a bad exercise to think about this. Uh, that was another one of the criticisms of Prothero's is that it's all kind of head and it's a little bit different than lived experience. But I think, I think we have some shared questions that, that then can help focus and also help define. Say, you know what, I do have my question over here and you have your question and let's actually learn about the differences between those questions. So I'm kind of curious in this moment, if you're, if you're willing to participate for a minute with me, what would be, what's your essential question? What is your essential question? And if you're in the room with me, you wanna shout it out, I'll repeat it into the microphone if you would. What is your essential question? What's your mountain? What do you think? Now you can kind of jump in as I'm like going on here, because I'd love to hear. 
one of the ones that would be in Unitarian Universalism uh, is how to love. How to love. How to live in a compassionate way. Because the problem, one of the problems in uni that I think Unitarian Universalism deals with is separation and not knowing how to be with one another. Because we know hanging out on the beach with all of our friends and maybe people we don't know, we know that's a good thing as an image, but how? How? I'm sorry? Just follow your heart. Just follow your heart? The how? Follow your heart? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's that? How to be inclusive? Mm-hmm. How to actually be welcoming? Yeah. How to practice the welcome? Yep. Yep. I would agree. It's a practice. How to make a living without compromising beliefs? Yeah. Yes, sir. Why do children die? Thank you, Tom. Yeah. I think we're having that one a lot right now, huh? Yes. What's the point of all the struggle? What's the point of all the struggle? What's the point of all the struggle? Gosh, yes. What's the point of all the struggle? It's being, hmm? One more? Which one? What is the point of all the struggle? What is? Victor Frankel. Mm -hmm. Victor Frankel kind of answered that question, yeah. Yeah? I say, what he said, there is meaning in suffering. Uh, he said there is, Frank, so Viktor Frankl, his response to suffering is that there is meaning in suffering. Yep. Now, I'm going to offer a little note that says, not everything happens for a reason. Because I don't want to say, you got to suffer, right? I'm not going to tell you that you have to suffer. We're acknowledging the presence of suffering and we can find a path with it. A lot of the suffering is the result of greed. A lot of the suffering is the result of greed. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Is there a point where the various religions intersect? Yep. And I think that's partially what Karen Armstrong does in her work, is to look and say, you know, here's how Islam calls, you know, what she's saying in her compassionate living work is that, uh, that every, in her experience of looking at a multiple different religious traditions, that in one way, shape, or form, every tradition calls us to be compassionate, calls us to be loving, calls us to be invitational, calls us to serve one another. Now, how they do that, that's all distinct. But every, you know, she offered in Buddhism, she offered in Islam, she offered in Christianity, offered in Judaism, in her um, annual pluralism address in 2018. She was kind of naming all of the ways in which, and she's saying in that, she went a little deeper in saying that she's not so concerned, you know, part of what we get bound up into is the culture but how do we, it's about how we are practicing with each other, how we are practicing our beliefs. How do we live in a compassionate way? And she was keep trying to invite us to, to be less bound by, maybe to be less bound by our context and our culture and to say, what is it we really want to be living into? What are we aspiring to? What is it that my faith tradition calls me to? But clearly, that's the human challenge, 
right? Clearly that's this lived challenge that we're trying to navigate. And I am sad to say, no surprise, that it seems to be getting deeper in our time. There's wonderful and beautiful work out there of people being brought together to work together, but there's also so much difference. I think this is where my question for trying to bring this in this moment today is kind of recognizing how much difference there is and simply naming that so that we don't, don't think we're, we're don't kind of, I guess, diluting or, or missing that in our conversation. That simply naming that, yeah, there's some real different questions that we're coming from. That in itself, that in itself, the recognition of, of that, where it helps feed the emotional effort. Say so we're not missing something, this is really hard. But I want to share just one story of folks that I've been, I just learned about in the course of preparing for today, of how people are working together and trying to address the, um, the public, the, district, the difficulties of public conversation. Um, there is a group called Essential Partners, and they're based in Maryland, I think, at this point. They started with an idea uh, from a family therapist, Laura Chasson, uh, in 1989, who was, she was in the Boston area. And she kept seeing in her family practice how dysfunctional our, kind of our social conversation was, not just from families, but, but larger than the families she worked with. And one of the earliest actions this, that the group that she started to form was um, following a shooting at, a deadly shooting at the, uh, a clinic that um, performed abortions in the Boston area. Um, and while there was this public outcry for that, uh, for kind of responding, you know, religious leaders responding and so on, what she did and some others did was have a quiet conversation between religious leaders who had very, very different views on abortion and women's right to choose. And that was the starting point. Um, and people were building out from Boston there that moved into Washington, D.C. area. And their vision, the vision of this body remains the same, to have a world of thriving communities strengthened by difference and connected by trust. So this is a body that is working very directly with recognizing difference. Um, and those across culture and race and geography and women's health and emotion and environmental preservation one of the places where they um, kind of furthered their work was in 2018 after um, following in part on the deadly shooting in Parkland High School. Essential partners and some other groups got together to bring people from all over the country to talk about guns and gun control. And this really included people of radically different perspectives. I mean, radical like the root they were coming from deeply, profoundly different perspectives about gun control. And they spent three days together getting to know each other, talking with each other, and truly listening and asking questions, and not being shy about asking a question, and, but kept asking for clarification with the method that these folks use. And, and in those three days, they created a morsel of trust a morsel of understanding, enough that a number of them were willing to keep doing the work after the conference, and they followed up with um, a little bit of public speaking, but also being on Facebook. As you can imagine, if you're familiar with Facebook at all, you know that trying to have a public discourse on gun control on Facebook is, holy cow, um, truly a brave choice and truly going to cost emotionally. But they did that. 
they did that. They continued this conversation about guns and gun control. And they did this for a specific amount of time. And they were actually even able to tame Facebook. They were even able to, in both in Facebook conversations and in conversations directly with one another, keep the conversation going. And here's part of what happened, and here's what I want to offer as we're trying to navigate what is difference right now. They were able to slow down enough to listen to each other, to not just be a sound bite. So they were able to slow down and listen. And they were also able, because they had listened, those who were at the core of this had listened to each other well enough at the beginning. They were able to speak up for each other when someone was being harmed or attacked. They had created enough of a connection and enough trust to be able to show up for the other person, even though they were holding very different views, and to say, hold on a second, You're, this is not how we treat each other. I, I ask that you treat somebody, treat somebody better. They were able to articulate questions, doubts, and differences, and find spots of commonality and come away a little bit different than when they had started, a little bit of transformation in the moment. Recognizing the depth of our differences, I want to say what they were taking away, what this group was taking away from this just one conversation was if we can go deeply enough we can hear people. If we can go deeply enough, we can hear people. So as we go forth, continuing our public discourse, whether it is civil or uncivil or everything in between, how much each of us can be part of that listening and part of that effort simply because we're willing to be in this conversation. I invite each of us, and myself included, to pace yourself. Show up as well as you can. Take care of yourself, but do as much of the work as possible. I think that is one of our callings in our, our living of Unitarian Universalist values is to be able to show up as often as we can, as well as we can, knowing that the work is granular, like grains of sand on a beach, granular. But it also adds up. It also adds up. I look forward to keeping hearing the questions and the conversations as we go. Amen. For our closing hymn, I want you to rise and body your spirit and join me for Woya Ya. And it's very much one of my favorites for saying, we don't know where we're going, but we're going. We're going. So please rise and body your spirit for Woya Ya.
from Lisa Doge. Why a flaming chalice, the question comes. It's the cup of life, we answer. A cup of blessings overflowing, a cup to quench our spirit's thirst, a cup of wine for celebration and dedication and the flame of truth. It's oil for anointing and healing. It is the fire of purification. Out of chaos and fear and horror, thus was the symbol crafted a generation ago, and so may it be for us in these days of uncertainty and sorrow and rage. Let it be a light to warm our souls and guide us on our way. We go forth carrying each of us a bit of this light out into the world. May the blessings of truth and light and hope be upon us. We recognize all that is in our hearts, all that is the diversity of our lives, the full range of our human experience, and boy, we keep asking those darned questions along the way. Let us embrace the entirety of our human experience as we go forth into a bruised and hurting world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Mm -hmm.